I don't know what, what's going on. So I'm calling you to make noise, to make noise, to make noise, really. It was July 30th, 2023, just weeks after the military coup in Niger. In the last two years, six countries across Western and Central Africa suffered what the UN has called an epidemic of coups. The United States is suspending security cooperation with military forces in Niger. Since the year 2020, six countries in West and Central Africa have experienced military takeover and they're all former French colonies. That number is now seven. We've had the Arab Spring. This is the Francophone Spring. People are fed up with civilians ruling countries without delivery beyond uh, their own interests. Historically, a typical military coup involves the most senior members of the military junta overthrowing the government in a short but potentially violent incident that causes fear and mass panic in the population. However, recent events have unveiled a new era of military intervention in Africa, one that has garnered mass and even popular support among the local people. A shift in dynamics that demands attention and answers to the question, what is really going on in Africa? And what does it mean for the future of democracy on the continent? Coup cool. d'etat. The, the term is a French word which literally means blow of state. It's also defined as a sudden, violent, and unlawful seizure of power from the government. Over the years, the word has become almost synonymous to Africa. However, coups have existed in different parts of the world for hundreds of years and only became rampant in Africa in the post-colonial period in the 1960s and 70s. Well, up until now. Since 2020, seven countries in West and Central Africa, former French colonies, have witnessed military takeovers, begging the question, as always, to understand the present, we must go back to the past, and specifically to the rise of the French Empire. The French were in Africa as early as the 1600s, initially with an interest focused on establishing trading posts and engaging in economic activities, especially along the coastal region. However, in the late 19th century, something changed. In the 1800s, the surge in industrialization heightened the demand for raw materials and resources, prompting European powers to intensify their efforts in colonizing African territories to secure a stable supply. As industrialization fueled economic competition, France shifted its strategy in Africa from mere economic interests to a comprehensive desire for political control, resource extraction, and cultural assimilation. This marked a crucial turning point in French colonialism in Africa, where the colonial enterprise became intricately linked with the economic imperatives of the Industrial Revolution. Following the Berlin Conference in 1894, France colonized North, West, and Central Africa between 1890 and 1914. Its first colony was Algeria, colonized earlier in 1830. Other colonies included Senegal, Chad, Mali, Benin, Sudan, Gabon, Tunisia, Niger, Cameroon, and the Côte d'Ivoire. The French formed a loose federation of all its colonies in West Africa with its headquarters in Dakar, Senegal. And unlike the British who are mainly interested in securing a few outposts in Africa to promote trade and other forms of business, the French adopted a policy of assimilation and direct rule, imposing French language, laws, culture and traditions. In the mid-20th century, a wave of African nations gained independence through diplomatic negotiations, armed struggle or a combination of both. This process culminated into the decolonization of Africa. And French colonies in Africa were finally free. Right? Wrong. 
Despite French colonies gaining independence, French colonialism continued in a more streamlined, exploitative, and profitable form. Achieving this was simple. Each time an African country would gain independence, it signed a cooperation agreement with France outlining relations with the French going forward. And key conditions under these agreements were as follows. Number one, giving France rights to natural resources. Number two, allow France to station troops in their territory and most importantly, keep their currencies linked to France's currency, the franc. So instead of the so-called independent former French colonies using their own currencies, they were to use the franc of the French communities of Africa, CFA franc, formerly the franc for French colonies in Africa. Same acronym, just a different name. In exchange for consenting to the conditions of the cooperation agreements, France gave massive foreign aid to its former colonies. Initially, this agreement ran smoothly. Moreover, many of the first generation leaders in post-colonial French colonies were essentially installed by the French, who went to great lengths to protect their hand-picked dictators. Take Gabon, for example. Historically, Gabon has always been especially important to France given its huge supply of oil and uranium. The first president of Gabon, elected in 1961, was Leon Ba, with Omar Bongo Odimba as his vice president. After Ba's ascension to power, the press was suppressed, political demonstrations and freedom of expression curtailed, and other political parties gradually excluded from power while the constitution changed along French lines to vest power in the presidency. When Imba dissolved the National Assembly in January 1964 to institute a one-party rule, an army coup sought to hoist him from power and restore parliamentary democracy. Within just 24 hours, French paratroopers flew into Gabon to restore Mba to power. After days of fighting, the coup ended with the opposition in prison with protests and riots. When Mba died in 1967, Bongo, equally a close ally to France, replaced him as president and successfully turned the country into a one-party dictatorship. Unsurprisingly, under Bongo, France and Gabon enjoyed cordial relations with France's state-owned oil company Elf pumping Gabon's oil while its uranium went into France's nuclear weapons. In return, France subsidized Gabon's budget, channeling significant funds that conveniently ended up in the pockets of Omar Bongo and his family. At one point, Bongo's net worth is said to have reached $130 million. Meanwhile, Gabon continues to grapple with persistent poverty and underdevelopment, marked by one of the highest infant mortality rates globally. On 8 June 2009, President Omar Bongo died of cardiac arrest at a Spanish hospital in Barcelona and was replaced by his son, Ali Bongo. After a contested election and protests that led to four deaths, deployment of gendarmes and the military, and a curfew that lasted more than three months. But as effective as it may seem, political manipulation isn't the only tool in the arsenal of what has been termed French neo-colonialism. Enter the world of the CFA franc. One currency to rule them all. The CFA franc, originally the franc of the French colonies in Africa, is actually the name of two currencies. The West African CFA franc used in eight West African countries and the Central African CFA franc used in six Central African countries. Although separate, the two CFA franc currencies have always been at parity and are effectively interchangeable. Before the franc was introduced, some African areas used their own currencies, such as the Kauri, which was widely used in West Africa and Manila used in the Ivory Coast. But at the end of the 19th century, France began to create local markets in their colonies where the only legal currency was the franc. They also prohibited the use of other currencies and forbade the payment of colonial taxes in Calgary. 
The CFA prong was created on December 26, 1945. The reason for its creation was the weakness of the French franc immediately after World War II. When the French ratified the Bretton Woods Agreement in December 1945, the French franc was devalued in order to set a fixed exchange rate with the US dollar. Thus, new currencies were created in the French colonies to spare them from the strong devaluation. Then French Minister of Finance was quoted as saying, in a show of her generosity and selflessness, Metropolitan France, wishing not to impose on her faraway daughter, the consequences of her own poverty is set in different exchange rate for their currency. However, the introduction of the CFA front was by no means out of pure magnanimity, but rather to strengthen France's own influence in the region following its humiliating defeat during World War II. The overvalued CFA front made imports from France cheap for the colonies, boosting France's economy. However, it also raised the prices for their exports globally, making it harder to compete internationally. As a result, the colonies became economically dependent on France, which profited from increased exports and affordable imports. Furthermore, the fixed exchange rate meant that CFA countries needed French franc and later the euro to honor the promise of converting CFA francs at a set rate. This dependency reinforced economic ties between the colonies and their former colonial master. In other words, the countries that use the CFA franc even today have no monetary sovereignty, thereby making national monetary policies for the developing countries of French West Africa all but impossible. Now here you may ask, how long has this been going on? And whether or not African leaders realize what's happening. And this is where things get complicated.